I'm not going to let them preach because they might preach better than me. They're a whole lot cuter than I am. Hey, be good on that one. And, um, but anyway, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. I want to start reading in verse 18 this evening. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 18. And once you have found it, let's all stand as we read the word of God. Matthew chapter 21 verse 18. From those in Texas, that's the first book in the New Testament. I'm just letting you know. I'm just letting you know. Brother Wilson keeps on mouthing off. I want to send Dennis the Menace after him real soon. That's that great Bible story you missed in the scriptures. But anyway, Matthew chapter 21, we're going to start reading in verse 18. The scripture says, now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. That means he was a Baptist. Just making sure you're awake. When he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have what? Faith. Faith. And what? Ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be what? Done. Done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Tonight I want to talk to our church tonight, and I want to help us tonight. I want to speak to you on the subject, Cursing Fig Trees and Moving Mountains. Cursing fig trees and moving mountains. Father, I'm asking you to allow me to be a help to your people. I get the privilege to be their pastor. But Lord, I know that in reality, you're the, you're the one that we follow. I'm asking thee this evening, allow me to be a help to this church in such a way. May I say what needs to be said and may I not say anything that my flesh would want me to say. Let me be totally yielded to thee. May you speak through my mouth and just make me a tool tonight to help your people, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The actions of Jesus on earth were no mistake. I often tell people everything that Jesus did and Everything that Jesus had done on earth was said and done on purpose. There is no uh-oh with God. Everything that we, we often sometimes, I'm afraid, we, we read the scriptures with the mentality that, well, it just happened. There is no happenstance with God. Everything was done on purpose. He prescribed it. He did it on purpose. There's a reason why he did it. I'm saying that everything that Jesus did and said were done and said on purpose. I'll even say this, his actions and words were said and done to teach those who followed him. Everything, when you read through the Gospels, always understand everything that Jesus did. He was doing it so he could train others. May I just stop and just give you a little side note on that little thought right there. That's why what we have to be careful what we say. Why? Somebody is, is watching us. What I say and what I do, I want to make sure that what I say and do helps everybody that's watching me to go down the right path. If you're a parent, you got a little child at, 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 in your house. And every time you miss church, your children know that you're missing in church. And every time you do something you're not supposed to do, they know that. And that's why we have to make sure that we're deliberate in what we do. But may I I continue and say this, Christ's actions and words were done and said to leave an example for those who watched him. Jesus was concerned about his disciples carrying on what he had what he was what he knew he was going to leave his ministry on earth was going to be short and so he only had a short time get this now to get across to these disciples what they needed to do and apparently he did a great job 
Because those 12 disciples, well, one of them, of course, was the devil, and so, so, so he was gone. Judas Iscariot was not saved and ended up in hell. But the other 11 turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ. Jesus did a good job in training the, the disciples. One of those teaching times we read about right here in the Scriptures. It says that here in verse 18, it says that, that and when he saw it, that, that it says in verse 18, in the morning as he turned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, it says, and found nothing thereon. It's interesting that, he ha- that he's, he's hungry and he goes to this fig tree. Now, he knew that the fig tree didn't have figs on it. He knew it was not even the time, get this now, for the, fi- for the fig tree to have figs on it. But he went to the tree, and the Scripture says he cursed it. When you read the stories of other Gospels, he, they went throughout their day, get this now, and they ministered, and then they came back, and when they came back, every fig on that, that tree had withered up and died because Jesus had cursed that fig tree. They marveled, the Scripture says that the disciples marveled that the tree had withered so quickly. And Jesus then says to them, he says, it was at this moment, he says, now listen to me. He says, if you, if you have faith, he says, if, he says, what happened to this fig tree is, he says, that's nothing. He says, let me help you out. He says, if you have faith, he says, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea. And God says, it'll be gone. It'll be, it'll be removed. What was Jesus saying? He was saying that in our life, there are, we, we must learn that there are things, we've got to curse the fig trees and build the, move the mountains if we want God to do, the, do something. You say, what are you talking about? Cursing the fig tree. I'm talking about doubt. You've got doubt, you've got faith. Faith moves the mountain. Doubt has to be removed so the mountain can be moved. Listen, several things about this scripture that God shows us about faith. For instance, faith is confident. Faith is confident. Jesus was so confident that the fig tree would wither that he passed by the same fig tree later on that evening. He cursed it. He went about his day. Then he came back by the same fig tree knowing that it would be withered. Listen to me. Faith doesn't act in an uncertain or timid fashion, but faith acts in confidence. Listen to me. If our church is going to be a church of faith, then we're going to have to be a church that becomes confident in what we're doing. I want you to listen to me. Stop worrying about what everybody says about us. Let's worry about what this book says, and let's follow this book. I, I, if someone says, well, what, what's everybody else going to think? I could care less what they think. Because I'm very confident in what we're doing here is what God wants us to do. Now, if every other church in the country thinks that we're a bunch of heathens, God bless them. I'm just going to follow this book right here. Why? Because faith is confident. But I also say this, may I say something else about faith? Faith has a vision. Jesus envisioned the tree dying. Get this. A person of faith can see the power of God and what it can do. You know, it's interesting. A faithless person is a visionless person who lives in doubt and uncertainty. And what happens is a person of faith, of, of faith has a great vision of what can be done with nothing or little or, or little nothing and acts confidently until faith becomes reality. Isn't it interesting that all Jesus had to start with the faith of disciples was a little fig tree? You know, your vision of what God can do is a revelation of your faith. It, it tells us how much faith you have. Now, sometimes, some of you, you, you get a little nervous when I start talking about what I believe God can do in this church, and let me, let me help you out. You've not even heard half of what I believe God can do here. I believe God can do something great. We've got a great group of people. Listen, we've got more than just a fig tree here. we got some good people. got some great people. Listen to me. Jesus only started with a fig tree. Listen, you said we got old buildings. That doesn't matter to God. Somebody help me out. You say, but preacher, you don't understand what we've got right here. You don't understand your God. 
At some point, listen, I, listen, I know, I know there's, there's churches out there, and we are, we're living in an era in our fundamental movement where everybody thinks you have to have Taj Mahal auditorium to be able to attract people. You know what you need? You need a church that has faith, that has a God, and says, let's go reach this area for Jesus Christ and go do something and get a vision of what God can do. Isn't it amazing with our old building that we have what God's done here? People being saved, people being baptized. You say, well, it's not the best of buildings. God never said you had to have the best. In fact, Jesus just met out in the street corner. We're so wrapped up in buildings and, and the facades, we're spending millions of dollars on facades, letting people die and go to hell somewhere. Yes, I think we ought to update what we have, and we ought to treat it the best we can. But listen to me, somewhere you just got to get a vision of faith and say, I believe God can do this. Faith is confident. Faith has a vision, but faith is also authoritative. Jesus said, be thou removed. Can I tell you, stop acting in question, act in faith. If you go soul winning with me, you'll, you'll, and those who've been soul winning with me know, when I go soul winning, I don't soul win in question, I soul win in faith. I don't go, well, I hope they get saved. I go believing they will get saved. Big difference. Big difference. I don't go so winning. Well, I hope they understand. I go so winning. I believe they're going to understand. Why? Because the gospel is so simple. And it's not a matter of me trying to get the gospel across to them. It's the Holy Spirit. I don't doubt the Holy Spirit's power. At some point, listen to me, a person of faith moves. This is what's interesting. A person of faith moves in a manner that scares the faithless person. You know, those, those who don't have faith, they see what's going on around here, and they're getting nervous. What's going to happen, preacher? Well, if you don't get with it, you're going to get crowded in that seat. Come on now. You say, why? Because faith acts in authority. Faith, is, faith doesn't move around in doubt because that's what the Satan's trying to do. He's trying to get us to doubt. Listen to me. At some point, get past yourself. Get past what Brother, Brother Doyen did a good job yesterday talking about you got to be a loser. I never had anybody tell me I have to be a loser. But anyway, he said you got to be a loser. What's he saying? You got to lose yourself. Got to lose yourself. Get over yourself. Stop trying to impress everybody. Just get busy in faith doing something for God, believing God can do it. I said faith is confident. Faith has a vision. Faith is authoritative, but faith causes a person to act. Verse 22 shows the key that makes faith happen, and the word is believing. Now listen, faith always moves to action. Doubt always moves to inaction. I can always tell who has greater faith in our church. Why? They're in, they're, they're in action. Those who aren't doing anything, they're, they're living in, in doubt. You say, how do you know? Because they're not, because they're not. Faith just moves you. Faith, it, it, it stirs you. There's something about faith that just gets you, it gets you going. Stop being afraid of your shadow and listen to faith and trust your God in heaven that he can do something through you. And what's interesting is this. God didn't say how much faith he had to have to move the mountain in this passage. But get this now. Faith is the key ingredient of the believer's life that causes God to do great works. God can never do anything through you if you don't believe God's great works can be done. Now listen to me. God's great works, I want you to get this, are there for you if you would just act in faith and believe that God can make great things happen. May I just talk to Maranatha Baptist Church tonight and may I say this. I believe God can do great things in Maranatha Baptist Church. God is already doing great things, but I think he can do greater things. 
I do not believe the works of the past were an anomaly. I believe they can still happen today if somebody has the faith and is willing to work hard enough to make it happen. Listen to me. I don't care. Well, well you know, I just don't want to offend anybody. Let me tell you something. Friction's going to cause some people to get hurt a little bit, but you got to keep on working in faith and stop listening to doubt. When people talk to me about our area, they say, what's your area like? I man, this is the easiest area to go soul winning in the world. Amen. Brother Hopkins got here. I said, man, this is a great soul winning area. I said, I said, man, it's easy to go soul winning here. It's the easiest place in the world. You say, why are you doing that? Because I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to turn their thing. Well, this is just a hard area. People just aren't receptive here. Well, you just let doubt just come into your soul winning. I want people to act in faith. I don't want people to move around. Well, you know, it's just a harder day. Oh, hogwash on that. We're not being crucified. We're not being hung on a tree. We're not being flayed alive. We're not being burned at the stake. We're not being boiled in oil. We have in a good time and an easy time to go so winning somewhere we got to get past. Well, this is just a hard day. A lot of sin. Don't you think there was a lot of sin in Jesus' day? Let me give you several statements. Statement number one, faith is always under attack. Faith is always under attack. Listen to me. Doubt attacks faith. I believe God can do great works today. But our faith is always under attack. You say, how is it under attack? Okay, it's under attack by you having to have your way instead of letting God have his way. Amen, preacher. Listen to me. I would hate to be the person in this church that because everything's not being done the way I want it to be done, that it kill the works of this church. Now, there's some people in the church that need to get right with the Lord about that. And I'm just being straight honest with you as a pastor. If it's not done your way, cross, the T's not crossed the way you want it, and the I's not dotted the way you want it, and you're killing the faith of this church. And what it is, it's pride. Amen, preacher. Keep on preaching. There's just two, there's 1.3 million people in this area. I'm not going to let my little pet peeve stop me from letting God do something. I want to jump on board and say, let's go reach people for Jesus Christ. If it's not always done my way, that's okay. It don't have to be done my way. I just want to make sure it's done the Bible way. And as long as it's not going against this book, let's go do something for God. Faith is always, listen, the devil's always after our faith. And he goes after it in every angle he can. He goes after it with sin. He goes after it with pride. He goes after it with selfishness. He goes after it with doubt. He's, always, he's trying to attack our faith. Faith is always under attack. Statement number two. Faith always starts with nothing or little at all. Faith always starts with nothing or little at all. That's what makes it faith. Look at what Jesus had to start with. Think about it. When you start reading about the disciples when Jesus started with them, he did not have the greatest crew to start with. He had one disciple that couldn't keep his mouth shut. In fact, he was still cursing. Come on now. And I know he wouldn't fit in the average independent Baptist church because he's not that model. But I'm glad that Christ knows better than us. Christ was willing to let them fail while he was trying to teach them because he knew one day he wasn't going to be there and one day they would grow to where they needed to be. I absolutely know why God brought me to this church. There was another church that was looking at me, listen to me, but they had nice buildings. They had everything that was there. God brought me here because we don't have the nice buildings. Had a great foundation to build upon here, but we have a long ways to go. Long ways to go. Brother O'Daniel, for 29 years, kept the foundation strong. 
I've just come in and I've built upon that foundation that he gave me from the word of God. And I'm listen to me now. And I'm listen to me. If I'd have gone to another church and done the same thing there, they'd have said, well, it's because you got the buildings and you're in this part of town and you got this right here. I'm glad that we have what we have. Why? Because I love this church. I love what we are. I love what we are about. I love everything about this place. Hey, thank God. Why? Because God starts. He starts with us. You didn't get much when you got Alan Donnelly as your pastor. Please don't say amen. (laughs) Thank you, Brother Wilson. God starts with nothing or little at all. And we grow together. And we, we see God doing miraculous things together. I don't think anybody in this building here thinks that we're, well, look uh, look how great I am. I don't think anybody believes that. We're all trying to encourage each other. I said faith is always under attack. Faith always starts with nothing or little at all. Number three, faith is provoked by vision. Faith is provoked by vision. Listen, no vision plus no faith equals mediocrity. Great vision plus Great faith equals great works. Because there's a lot of churches out there that don't believe it could be done in 2019, they're mediocre churches. Come on, somebody help me out just a little bit. Can I help you out? This is not this auditorium's not gonna house us. You say, preacher, you're scaring me. This auditorium is not going to house us. Say, are we going to go somewhere else? No, this is going to become too small. So how do you know? Faith. I know. I know the doubtless person will be critical of that statement. That's okay. See, what happens, what happens, preacher? What happens if it doesn't happen? Listen to me. I'm saying faith provokes vision, which leads me to this. Act on the faith you have. Act on the faith you have. Listen to me. I would rather fail at having too big of a vision than succeed at having a vision of mediocrity. You say, what if we don't fill this auditorium up? I'd rather fail at that than to come in and say, well, you know, it's just not going to ever happen here. You know, if I came in here tonight, well, you know, people, it's, it's just hard out there. That doesn't stir people to want to get involved in this church. You know what gets you? What's, what, why some of you are getting involved? Because you got a pastor that has a vision that says it can be done. It can be done. I'd rather fail in acting on faith than to succeed at sitting and doubting. And by the way, you'll always find this: the one who sits and doubts is critical. Of the one who's acting. It's like watching sports. If you're a sports nut, you know what I'm talking about. Nothing worse than listening to sports commentators. They think they can coach better, think they can play better, and the truth is they're so big, they, they may be the basketball. Listen to me. And they think that they can, they, they've, they've never even coached one. They can't even keep their marriage together, and yet they think they can coach an NBA team. Listen to me. It's easy to say it when you're not in the game. You get in the game, and all of a sudden, yes, they're going to start shooting at you. That's okay. Faith gets you to action. I said statement number one, faith is always under attack. I said statement number two, faith always starts with nothing or little at all. Faith, uh, statement number three, faith is provoked by vision. Statement number four, I, let me, let me just start, go back there and just say this. Mom and dad, you want your children to act by faith and give them a vision. Listen to me. I do not want our youth department just to ra- raise a bunch of teenagers and say, well, you just go out and do your best for, uh, just, just do your, you know, get, get, get something big in the world. No, I want our teenagers to be raised up to go out and serve God in full-time service. I want a vision for them. I want our teenagers to say, boy, I want to go serve God full time. You say, what about the doctors and what about this and what about that? Let's go lead them to Christ. Christ. 
But every teenager ought to have a drive and a vision inside that mom and dad say, hey, God can do something great with you. By the way, mom and dad, that's why you should stop belittling your kids all the time. Well, you're never going to become of anything. Yeah, not, not with that kind of encouragement. Every teenager ought to hear mom and dad say, hey, hey, you, you, you can do it. God, God can do something great. My mom and dad, they always tell me, son, God's going to do something through you. I said, statement number four, act on the faith you have. Statement number five, follow a person of faith until you have faith. Follow a person of faith until you have faith. So I don't have faith. Okay, then find someone who does. Follow them. The disciples didn't have faith, so what they do? They followed Christ. Until they had the faith. You see, they didn't have the faith to cast out the sickness. Remember that? And Jesus said, this kind cometh forth by nothing but by what? Prayer and fasting. But hold on. We read in the book of Acts, they're doing the same works that Christ did. Why? Because when they didn't have faith, they found a person who did have faith, and they got behind them, and they didn't sit there and criticize him. They said, we want to, we want to learn everything we can. We want to figure out how to have this kind of faith. Statement number six, faith is contagious. Faith is contagious. When you have faith, it encourages others. This past Monday, we had a Memorial Day picnic. People came from everywhere. I learned one thing. We did not have enough grills. Brother Wilson, Brother Davidson, and myself are out there trying to cook burgers as fast as we can with about one flame. And I said, next year we're going to have, I said, I said, I made the statement. I said, next year we need to have, we need to get six charcoal grills because the charcoal grills just grill faster than the gas grills and brother davidson said it's all his fault brother davidson said oh preacher that's not gonna be enough next year i said why he said do you think we need a few more he says oh no no he says the crowd will be bigger next year what happened faith is contagious It's contagious. Somebody else, I, don't, I can't remember who it was, somebody else said to me, say, you see this crowd preacher? Vacation Bible School's coming up. There's going to be more than this in Vacation Bible School. It's like, please don't do that to me. <laughs> Why? Faith is contagious. When I was a boy growing up watching my parents' faith, it was contagious. It stirred me. When I was a boy growing up listening to pe- preachers talk about faith, it stirred me. It was contagious. It put something inside of me. Now, I'm saying this. Follow a person of faith until you have faith because when you follow them, you're going to find it becomes contagious. Hey, boy, look look what happened here. I think of a guy I worked for years ago. His name is Gary Knopf. We were out in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Cheyenne, Wyoming has has the big population of 50,000 people, and I think that's stretching it. I remember the first one, one year, he said, we're going to have 1,000 in church. I'm thinking 1,000 in this town. We worked hard. We had 1,000. Next year, he said, we're going to have 1,500. We had 1,500. You know what? You know what that did? That started stirred in my heart. His faith stirred my faith. That's why I don't criticize the men from the past who had a great faith. The Tom Malones and the Lee Robertsons and the Jack Howes and the, and the, and the, and the, and the J. Frank Norris's and, the, and even some of the men who are so, I don't, I don't, I don't criticize their faith. Why? Because their faith encourages my faith. And I'm telling you, somewhere we've got to have a church filled with people that I can believe. I believe it can happen. Statement number seven, don't let your doubt leak out and destroy the works that faith can do. There was one city Jesus could do no works in. It was his own hometown. You know why they doubted him? Hi, this is little Jesus boy. Not you, the real Jesus. (laughs) 
just saying. It's just a little Jesus boy, you know, it's cute. It's cute watching him think he can do all of this. Can I just say this? Some of these young generations that, that are stepping up, let's not get so that some of us who are older, not me, you, some of us who are older, let's not get to that point, well, you know, it's cute to watch, you know, it's cute to watch a little Caleb and a little Tremble to get up here and think they can lead singing. Come on now. Book, encourage them. Just go to Brother Tremble. Brother Tremble, you're never going to be as handsome as Brother Donnelly, but you're doing good. <laughs> Don't let your doubt leak out. Listen to me. I would hate to think that someone's in this room right now. It says, oh, preacher, he's, he's been going to the wrong places. I think he's on the wrong stuff because he's got this vision. I, I, think he's, I think he may be a little high. I think he's going to one of the CBD places. I told Brother Bruce not to bring me there, but anyway. No. All it takes is one person of doubt. Eh, it's not going to happen here, Brother Melvin. <laughs> that preacher, he don't know this area. You know, he's not been in our church all these years. He don't, he, you know, we'll just kind of humor him. We'll humor the preacher until he finds out it doesn't work here. Somebody let the crickets in. Would you stop humoring those who have a vision of faith? Would you get rid of your doubt and decide, let's go do something? I was told this afternoon there's someone in our church that, that says I, uh, they'd like to start a special needs Sunday school class. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. It just takes the right person. What's that? Faith. Well, you know, they're hard to reach. But at least somebody has a vision to reach them. You know, you know those apartment complexes, they're hard, to, they're hard to get people here. Well, yeah, with that kind of attitude. Listen to me. Somewhere we got to have a faith that says, okay, I'm not going to let the doubt leak out of me and kill somebody else's faith. Statement number eight, pray that the vision of faith becomes reality. Pray that the vision of faith becomes reality. Can I ask you to do a few things? Here we go. Can I ask you to pray that God will fill this place up on a Sunday night? Pack out this auditorium on a Sunday night. Would you, would you pray with me on that? You know, I told you at the beginning of the year I wanted 20 young families. Would you pray with me that God would give us 100 laborers? Laborers. <laughs> you say, preacher, now you're starting to scare me. Would you pray with me about it? You say, why do you want 100 labors? Because I know there's 1.3 million that have a soul. Many of them have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. They're religious. But there's got to be some people in this city that has a burden for this city. So I'm going to jump in. I'm going to become a laborer. I want, to help. I want God to do something with my faith. I want God to see this thing happen. I want to pray that God increases my faith, that God allows me to and pray for the vision of faith. I would love to one day see 50 buses out here going around and picking up people all over the city. You say, preacher, you... Are, are you serious? Pray with me about it. Amen. 
I'm not asking everybody to do all the work. I'm asking you to pray that God sends us laborers. People who have a heart. So I want to see God do something in my day. I don't want to get old one day and, and, and before I die that my daughter doesn't see some of the great works that have happened in, our, in my lifetime. I want this young generation to get a glimpse of the power of God so that way when I'm gone and I'm, and I'm running down the street of gold in heaven, I want them to be able to say, well, we were in a church of faith that God did something mighty and they try to challenge the next generation to do something mighty. Oh, would to God tonight you'd start praying and say, God, increase my faith. God, help our church. Number nine. Act in faith by working towards what faith says will happen. Act in faith by working towards what faith says will happen. Faith always causes you to work. It always does. So, act in the belief side instead of the doubt side. Wherever you are tonight. You should preach, I don't have a lot of faith. I have very, very little. Okay, then find somebody in this church that has a greater faith and get behind them. Okay, what can I do to help? Till my faith grows. Some of you Sunday school teachers, listen to me. Some of you Sunday school teachers, listen. Your faith needs to get bigger. Every family in this church ought to say, I'm going to fill a pew with my converts. If everybody in here tonight says, I want to to grab a pew, I want to fill it. In the next 52 weeks, I want to fill my pew. I want to have my converts that God's used me to lead to Christ. We can make an impact in this area. And we can show all the negative people out there that the old time religion is alive and well. You don't have to have a rock concert. You don't have to let down your standards. You don't have to look like the world just to build a church. You can do it the old fashioned way. Act in faith. Get involved. If you're the one that's hurting the faith of others, then come down to this altar tonight and get right with God. Because I'm telling you this, I'd hate to sit and, ha- I'd, oh, Brother Stafford, I'd hate to stand before God one day. God said, you know, your church was going to do something, but boy, you, your mouth couldn't stop criticizing And leak in the doubt. I'd hate to sit in before stand for my God. And I was the one. I believe this stuff is real. If I didn't believe it, I'd retire. I'd go find a golf course. And Brother Williams, will you and I go play golf? We may play 200 golf, but we'd play golf. Listen to me. I just believe God can do something here. I believe right now I'm looking at the people. There's no mistake you're here tonight. I'm looking at the people that God can use. Father, it's time we curse our fig trees of the doubt. We decide let's go build some mountains. The mountain of a bus route and the mountain of a pew and a mountain of a Sunday school class and a mountain, Lord, just... Whatever mountain, build this church. I know you build the church, but you use your people to go. I believe it can happen here. Dear God, tonight, please challenge the hearts of your people that we become a people of faith. Heads of